Hi, my name is Dr. Peg Dawson. I'm a psychologist at the Center for Learning and Attention Disorders in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where I specialize in the assessment of children and adults uh, with learning and attention disorders. Uh, in this talk today, I, I plan to talk about the impact of brain development on adolescent behavior. Uh, and the information for this presentation is compiled primarily from a recent book published by the American Psychological Association called The Adolescent Brain, Learning, Reasoning, and Decision Making, edited by Raina Chapman, Dougherty, and Comfrey, and from an upcoming book called Smart But Scattered, The Teen Years, written by Guare, Dawson, and Guare, to be published by Guilford Press sometime in the next several months. What I plan to do is dis discuss recent research on teen brain development focusing on a key aspect, risk-taking. To do this, I'll talk about frontal lobe development in particular since this region of the brain plays a primary role in the acquisition of risk-taking. It is in the frontal lobes that executive skills reside. These are brain-based skills that are needed to execute tasks. They include ta skills such as task initiation and sustained attention, as well as planning and organizational skills, but they also involve impulse control and emotional regulation. We know from studies conducted over the last 20 years or so that these skills take about 25 years to reach full maturation. Let's start by talking about how brain development affects how teenagers assess risk. We know from fMRI studies that when children and teenagers perform tasks requiring executive skills, they rely on the prefrontal cortex, that's the part of the brain just behind the forehead, to do nearly all of the work rather than distributing the workload to other specialized regions of the brain. These other regions, in particular the amygdala and the insula, are two parts of the brain that are activated when making quick decisions that affect safety and survival, this, the fight or flight response as it's often called. In contrast to children and teenagers, adults can spread out the workload in part because they have had years of practice to develop the neural pathways to make this possible. When risky situations are described to adults, the risk is so obvious to them and they are so practiced in understanding those risks that they don't have to engage large areas of the frontal lobes. Adolescents, on the other hand, have to make an effort to engage frontal lobes to determine if in fact the situation in front of them does represent a significant risk. Interestingly enough, given hypothetical situations, adults and teens judge risk similarly. So why is it that teens engage in risky behavior more often than adults? In part, because of what neuroscientists refer to as hot versus cool cognition. Hot cognition is thinking under conditions of intense emotion or high arousal. For teens, anything that arouses emotion, fear of social rejection, the need to look cool, disappointing someone, disagreement with parents, can lead to hot and less rational thinking. This helps explain why we advise parents to maintain their cool in discussions and disagreements with teens. Strong emotional reactions from parents just fuels the emotional reactions from their teens. Another area of the brain involved in risk-taking is the limbic system. This is the more primitive and emotional part of the brain. As adults, we still experience the emotions and drives that originate in the limbic system, but the prefrontal cortex helps to regulate and tamp down these emotions and drives. Because of incomplete development of the prefrontal cortex in teens, they rely more on the emotional parts of their brain in decision making. And what's the result? They will be quicker to anger, show more intense mood swings, and make choices based on gut feeling rather than logic. So how can we help teens make better decisions? A study by Schneider and Caffrey looked at what motivates teens to either engage in or avoid both health-threatening behaviors such as smoking and drinking and health-enhancing behaviors such as exercising and eating healthy foods. This study points to the strong role that affective or emotional states play in teen decision-making. The study is too multifaceted to, summarize, to fully summarize here. But the authors suggest that as we work with teenagers, we may be able to promote or support attitudes that serve as protective factors that encourage healthy choices and discourage unhealthy ones. For example, we know that teenagers who are making plans for the future and have a positive view of the future are less likely to engage in health-threatening behaviors and more likely to engage in health-enhancing behaviors. 
Thus, it makes sense for parents, teachers, and counselors to spend time helping teens think about and plan for the future. We can also emphasize the notion of anticipatory regret. This is a concept operationalized by statements such as, I wouldn't want to do that because it might harm my future. In the study done by Schneider and Caffrey, this kind of anticipatory regret was very frequently voiced by teenagers as a reason for avoiding risky behaviors such as smoking or for engaging in healthy behaviors such as exercise. We also know that teenagers who have positive views about their own values and capabilities are more likely to engage in health-enhancing behaviors. In the Schneider and Caffrey study, these young people were more likely to endorse statements such as, drinking and drugs mess with your brain, or people who do drugs are going nowhere. The clinical application of this is that we need to help teenagers focus on their positive attributes rather than dwelling on perceived shortcomings in order to enhance self-efficacy and increase the likelihood that they will pursue healthy habits. This study not only provides a direction clinicians may want to move in in helping teenagers develop a mindset for good decision-making, but it also extracts a principle that is particularly relevant when working with teens around decision-making. While teens need to be encouraged to make rational, well-thought-out choices, we also need to recognize the role that emotions and feeling states play in decision-making. Decision-making actually involves dual processes, a thoughtful, analytic process alongside a more experience-based, affective, intuitive, or what Schneider and Caffrey called gist-based decisions that take into account emotions, which these authors feel may be at least as critical in making high-quality decisions as analytic approaches. If this is the case, then we need to spend more time with teens focusing on how they can channel their emotions to drive good decision-making, rather than just encouraging them to set their emotions aside and think more rationally. In this presentation, I've touched on only one aspect of recent brain research and how it's contributing to our understanding of how the teen brain differs from any other age group, but it also how we can take that understanding to inform educational and clinical practice. I encourage viewers to seek out additional resources.